This is C++ Lecture 5, Loops and File Input Output. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. All right, so last time I gave you a little bit of homework. I uh, gave you two examples of if statements, uh, with the only difference being the placement of some braces. And I asked you to figure out what was different about the uh, two if statements, or two uh, blocks of code. So let's take a look at that. So here's the first example. It says if hours less than nine, and then there's an opening brace. And then inside we have another if, so we have nested ifs. And this is if hours is greater than six, see out hello, closing brace, and then else, and then see out goodbye. So the way uh, I think to approach this is let's figure out what set of conditions, what what range of values for hours will cause the word hello to be displayed and, and, and goodbye. And then we'll do the same thing with the other uh, uh, if statement where the nested ifs where there's no braces. So first of all, let's see if we can figure out when it displays the word hello. So to get here, to run the see out statement, this if needs to be true. Okay, so hours greater than six must be true. When that's true, when hours is greater than six, this line of code will run. So I'm just going to make a comment over here. I'll just use the letter H and I'll just say hours greater than six. That's when this runs. That's when it displays hello. Okay, but how did we get here? How did we get to this line? So we only get to this if statement if this if statement is true. Because if, if this is true, then we'll enter this if statement and we'll run this code down here. So this must be true in order to get it to hours greater than six test. So hours must be less than nine. Let me just write it like this. I'll just say nine and then hours has to be less than nine. So hours has to be less than nine. This one has to be true. And then hours has to be greater than six. This one has to be true. So when both of those are true, this is the condition that will cause the word hello to be displayed. All right, now what about goodbye? Okay, so how does it get down here uh, to run this see out statement? It runs the see out statement that displays goodbye as part of the else clause. And the question is, which if does this else belong to or does this else get associated with? And here's the answer, here's, here's the solution to this problem. The compiler will match the first or the earliest preceding if that it can find uh, to go along with the else, but it will not go inside a compound statement. So when the compiler sees the word else, it'll look for a matching if, but it will not search for that if inside a compound statement or inside braces. So here's the word else. The compiler is going to look for the matching if, but it's not going to look between these two braces. And so the first if that it sees is this top one up here. So in this example with the braces, this if, this first if, and this else go together. So this is the if else statement. The one inside here is just an if statement by itself. Okay, so now that we know that, how does it get down here to the see out goodbye? This if must be false. So when hours less than nine is false, it'll go to the else and it'll display see out goodbye. So the opposite of this condition is when it displays goodbye. And that's an important point. In an if else, the if condition runs when this is true. The else condition runs when the opposite is true. Let me say that again. If this is true, you run the code inside the if. So whatever the condition is, whatever the expression is, if it's true, you run the code inside the if. If that expression is false, the code inside the else runs. But when that expression is false, it means by definition, the opposite is true. So what's the opposite of this? What's the opposite of hours less than nine? And I gave you that table of opposite logical conditions. So the opposite of hours less than nine is hours greater than or equal to nine. Don't forget the equal, that's important. So when hours greater than or equal to nine is true, it'll display goodbye. 
Okay, so hello is displayed when hours is less than nine, greater than six, and goodbye is displayed when hours is greater than or equal to nine. All right, now let's go to the other example where there's no braces. So same code, just no braces. We'll do the same sort of thing. When does it display the word hello? Well, hours greater than six had to be true before, and that's still the case here. That we have to this has to be true in order to run the statement that's inside this if. So hours greater than six must be true. Okay, so hours greater than six. How do we get to this if? Same as before, this one up here has to be true. So hours less than nine must be true. And so if that's true, I'll just do like I did before. So hours must be less than nine. Okay, so hours is less than nine, hours is greater than six. Well, that's the same. I'll, I'll go up to the previous slide. That's the same. Hours less than nine, greater than six. That's when it displays hello. Same thing here. Hours less than nine, greater than six. Okay, what about goodbye? Now here's where the difference is. There's no braces in this example, so when the compiler sees the word else and it's looking for the matching if, it's going to match these two together. This if and this else go together. So the indentation here is misleading. The compiler doesn't care about indentation though, so if you wrote the code like this, if you ended, indented it like this, it will compile just fine. So this if, the second if actually, is the one that uh, has the matching else. Which means, how do we get down here? How do we get to see out goodbye? We get down here when the second if is false. Or the opposite condition is true. And that means the opposite of this, this is statement, hours greater than six. And so that would be hours less than or equal to six. That's the opposite logical condition. Hours less than or equal to six. And is that different? Uh, is that different than the previous example? Let's go back to the previous slide. And yes, it is. So before, when we had braces, the word goodbye is displayed when hours is greater than or equal to nine. Without the braces, the word goodbye is displayed when hours is less than or equal to six. What about the first if up here? Hours less than nine, does that impact anything down here? Well, you have to be this has to be true, this hours less than 9 has to be true in order to get into this second if. Now this may be a little confusing to look at, but all of this code in here, all of this if statement, all of this, this else, the see out statements, those are all part of an if else that's inside this outer if. And so yes, this must be true. This hours less than 9 must be true to get down here to this if else statement. But if I write that in here, you'll see it doesn't really have an impact. So the first part up here, this, yes, this must be true. Hours must be less than nine. But in order to get to the goodbye, this interior if, hours had to be less than or equal to six. So the less than nine really gets canceled out. It doesn't really have an impact on the word, on, on, in, this, in this example, doesn't have an impact on displaying the word goodbye. So the word good, goodbye is displayed when hours is less than or equal to six. So yes, the braces do make a difference. Also, this example points out an important uh, fact about testing your programs. When you are writing programs that have multiple paths, decision points, when, when you have if statements or any other, other type of decision, your program now has multiple paths that it can follow, multiple logical paths. This if can be true or false, this if can be true or false, and so that can cause the program to follow different paths through the code. If we did not test all of those paths, in other words, one of these is wrong. One of these uh, sections of code is incorrect. One of them should have the braces. It doesn't matter. It depends on the program, of course, but one of them would be incorrect. How would we know that unless we had entered test values that caused all of these paths to be followed? Because if we just entered test values that caused the word hello to be displayed, that's the same. It displays the word hello, all the conditions are the same. Ours is uh, less than nine, greater than six. That's the same as this one. If we really didn't test the program thoroughly, in other words, we, if, we, 
if we failed to enter test values that caused the word goodbye to be displayed, we might not notice that there was a logical error. So this is an example of a logical error. It's not a syntax error. The program compiles, there's no errors, there's no warnings. There's an error in the logic of this program. And the only way you know that for sure is through testing. So when you're testing these programs that have decisions in them, make sure you test all the possible paths. Just rerun the program and enter new test values that cause every path to be followed at least once uh, when you're testing your code. All right, so now on to the new, new material for this chapter, and that is writing code that loops. So the first loop type we're going to look at is the while loop. A while loop is very similar to the if statement in logic. Uh, instead of the word if, you have the word while, and then the expression, and the expression is exactly like an if statement. So anything you could write for an if statement, you can write for a while loop. When this expression is true, the code will loop. Now what does that mean to loop? So it literally, it does work very much like the if statement. When this is true, the program enters the while loop and runs the statement in here, or statements if you have a braces, just like with the if, you can have a compound statement, and then you can run multiple lines of code. So if this is true, or while this is true, I should say, this statement runs. And then, what's different, of course, about the while is, it automatically loops back up. So test the expression. Is the expression true? Yes. Enter the while, run this code, and then automatically it loops back up and it does that expression test again. It keeps looping until this is false. When this expression becomes false, then it exits the loop and it goes to the rest of the code. So that's how the while loop or while statement works. So here's an example. It says while count is less than 10, display count increment count, count plus plus adds one to count, and then it will loop back up. Now, what we don't see in this example is what's the starting value of count. So let's assume that count started at zero. Okay, so zero, somewhere up here in the code previous to this, we created the variable count, we initialized it to zero, it gets to the while statement, and it says while count less than 10. Well, zero is less than 10, so this is true. So now it's going to enter the loop, it's going to run this code, display count, increment count, and then it's going to automatically loop back up and do this test again. And it's going to keep doing that. Is it still true? Well, it was zero, now it's one. One is still less than 10, yes, it's still true. Display count, increment count, so now it's two, and then loop back up. It's going to keep looping until this is false, so when count reaches 11, so it'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, excuse me, when it's 10, uh, when count reaches 10, 10 less than 10 is false. So when count reaches 10, this will be false, and it will exit the loop and go to the rest of the code. Because of the way it works, once it enters the loop, once the loop, uh, once it goes in the body of the loop and starts looping, there must be something going on inside this code, in the body of the loop. There has to be something happening in here that will cause this expression to become false eventually. If it does not, if there's nothing in, if there's no code inside the body, that is affecting this result, then you have an infinite loop. Now normally we don't want infinite loops. Infinite meaning, of course, is going to run as long as the pro your program is running. If you stop your program, it stops looping. But as long as your program is running, an infinite loop will keep looping. Normally that's not the type of loop you want to create. And so if you fail to uh, put code in the body of the loop that alters this expression, if it starts looping, it will continue looping until you stop the program. Here's a flowchart. 
looks very similar to the if. We use a diamond for the, the, uh, the decision part. Instead of the word if, you can put while in there. And of course, in a real flowchart, don't use the word expression. Put whatever the expression is, count less than 10 or whatever it is that you're testing. You don't even need the word while as far as that goes. So in a real flowchart, you could just put the expression in there, count less than 10 or something. True false are possible results. True means we're looping. So you can have all kinds of code in here. I showed just one uh, statement, but there could be there could be process symbols, there could be input output. It just depends what your program is doing. So there could be all kinds of, of, of other symbols down here. And then at the bottom of the body, the loop body, all the code that's in the loop, at the bottom of that, it automatically loops back up. That's the arrow indicating the loop. And it keeps keeps looping until this expression is false, and then it exits the loop. Now here's a very common mistake uh, with flowcharts. The loop exits at the top. I mean, it makes the decision that the loop, the while loop makes the decision at the top of the loop. And there's two possible results. The expression is true, the expression is false. If the expression is true, it enters the loop, and we're looping. If the expression is false, it exits the loop. So the exit of the loop is from the diamond. The common mistake is to draw an arrow down here and then draw the symbols down here for the rest of your flowchart and make this the loop exit and not have it up here. But that's not correct. There's no decision point here. The decision is the diamond. So make your loop exit at the diamond, not down here. So here's an example. Uh, lecture 5 example 1, a little while loop. We have an integer variable count and we're initializing it to 1. And then it says while count is less than or equal to 10. Display count and display a space. And so here's what it displays. It's going to display 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Not all at once. It's doing this once per loop, of course. So the first loop is going to display 1 and a space. And then we're going to increment count by one, and it's going to loop back up. And then it's going to now count as two, so it displays two in a space, and then we increment count to three, and so on. When it reaches 11, when count reaches 11, this will be false, and it will exit the loop, and then we're going to wait for a key press, and then the program ends. So let's run this. Let's take a look at this. Lecture 5, example 1. So here's my code. I'll go ahead and run it. And there's what the output looks like. It just says see out count and a space. And so there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 as the loop ran. So the power of a loop is the fact that we can perform multiple operations with a very few lines of code. So with five or six lines of code, whatever I have here, I can write a program that loops multiple times. And the number of times that it loops is really simple to change. I just this one number. If I want it to loop a hundred times, I make this a hundred. The display may not be too clean, but we can go ahead and run this. It'll just wrap around on the screen. So there's one to a hundred. So the, the power of loops is the fact that with a few lines of code, we can execute many, many lines of, uh, with, with writing a few lines of code, we can actually execute many, many lines of code. Here's the same sort of thing, but this example, instead of counting up from 1 to 10, counts down. Of course, it doesn't matter. You can start your your uh, variable at any value you wish. So now in this example, instead of starting at 1, count starts at 10. And the loop now, since we're going to be counting down, the loop expression is different. So we want it to loop while true. And when, when the expression becomes false, that's when it stops looping. So now it says while count 
is greater than or equal to 1. So we start at 10, and as long as the count value, the count variable, is greater than or equal to 1, we're going to loop. When count, when this is false, which means when count is 0 or less, a negative number, we'll stop looping. So it's the same code before, it displays count, displays a space, and instead of adding 1 to count, we subtract 1 from count. So count is getting smaller, so we start at 10, it's going to get smaller each time, and when it reaches a small enough value, uh, 0 in this case, it will stop looping. So let's go ahead and run this. This is example 2. And there's the output. Started at 10, displayed 10 down to 1, and then count reached 0, and it stopped looping. And here's another example that may be a more practical example of a loop. Uh, this loop is going to fill in a table of numbers. So we're going to display uh, some table headings. We have uh, number, we have square, and we have cube. And it just displays some dashes just to underline those words. And what the program is going to do is it's going to fill in this table. So we're going to, we're going to fill in the left column uh, with, with numbers 1 through 10. So we'll have 1 through 10 in this column. And then in the middle column, we'll display the square of those numbers. And in the, in the third column, we'll display the cube of those numbers. That's what the program is going to do. And there's a couple uh, nice features here we're, we're, we're talking about in C++ with this example. So first of all is, notice when you are displaying a table, this is not really a feature, but this is a, something to pay attention to with loops. When you're displaying a table, the loop is going to fill in one row per trip through the loop, or per loop. But the table heading is displayed before the loop. And that's a fairly common mistake to try to put too much inside the body of the loop. So here's the loop. This is where the loop starts. Here's the first part of the loop, the while statement. Notice the heading is actually before that. So that's a one-time only thing. We're displaying the table heading before the loop. We're also initializing our, our loop variable, the, the thing we're using to count, uh, num in this case, we're initializing that before the loop also. So, so these two lines of code are not in the loop. They happen once before the loop starts. Okay, then we go into the loop. So it says num less than or equal to 10. So we started at one, so yes, it's true. Now we're going to enter the loop. So the body of the loop, this code, this is going to display one row of data in the table. Then we're going to loop, and it's going to display, that is when it loops, it'll display the second row of data in the table. And then it will loop, and the third row of data. So each loop displays one row of data in the table. So let's look at the code that does that. It says display set w4. Now we talked about set w. That, that's the uh, format specifier that reserves a field of character positions. And so whatever the number is in the parentheses is the number of characters uh, reserved. So set w4 reserves four characters. The next item displayed is right justified in that field. So we start out with num equal to 1. So there's my field. Set w4 is a field of 4. And num is 1. So when I display 1, it'll display the 1 in here. Right justified. Now how did we know to use 4? And, and the same thing, the next one is set w10. It's going to do set w10. So from where we left off, it'll do 10. How did we know to use 10? Here's a little trick. I have my table heading. I want the numbers that I'm going to display to line up in columns under those headings. I'm using the, the set W numbers to do that alignment. How do I know to use 4, 10, and 10? Here's what you do. Just, just start on the left edge 
of your of your table heading where do you want the right hand edge of these numbers to be displayed in other words this this column is going to be 1 through 10 so 1 2 3 under that column heading do i want them there count how many characters over the right edge is so let's say i want them where i have them drawn there where is that so from the left edge from this double quote how many character positions one two three four four characters over is where i want the right edge of that column that's the number you use in parentheses so four characters over you put a four in there and so those numbers will be lined up uh, under that character now what about the next one well start from where you left off do the same thing maybe it's a little hard to see the characters here because they're spaces but if you if you're coding uh, in the uh, editor you can actually just use the cursor and cursor over so if you do the same thing from here and you count over to where you want the right edge of of this column to be it'll be 10 so when you count over there will be 10 characters to the right edge of this column and that's where this 10 comes from and then do the same thing again and count over how many characters you want the right edge of this column and there will be 10 characters and so that little trick will help you get things lined up in columns uh, better on the first try you may have to go back and tweak things a little bit but that'll help you get things lined up and then so the first column is just the number the second column is the square and so there we're just calculating the square by multiplying the number by itself and the third column is the cube and we're just doing the same thing just num times num times num and that gives us the cube and then that's one row of data then we do a new line so the body of the loop displays one row and then returns back to the left margin and then we increment num so num goes up to the next value and then it loops and it's going to loop as long as this is true when that's uh, when that expression is false it stops looping so let's go ahead and take a look at this code so this is example three here's the code we just looked at let's go ahead and run this and there's what it looks like so you can see my table headings number square and cube and you can see the numbers are all night the columns are all nicely lined up under the table headings uh, using those using the little trick and, and the values I was talking about uh, in set W so you can see the the uh, values we use the 4 10 and 10 are still in there and you can see the results that we got using those values so there's the table headings and there's the values under them the number the square and the cube sentinel loops now a sentinel loop is not a while loop necessarily in fact we are we're going to look at some other loop types and you can uh, you can create sentinel loops out of any of the loop types we're going to examine what a sentinel loop is or uh, what what defines a sentinel loop is the way the loop is controlled what causes the loop to stop looping that's what makes it a sentinel loop and, and a sentinel loop is one that is controlled by an external input and that is it's going to keep looping until it sees a certain uh, external input value or range of values and when it sees that input it stops looping so because of that behavior we can't look at the code and say that's going to loop 10 times or that's going to loop five times the number of loops is dependent upon some sort of external input and unless you know what the external inputs are going to be you don't know how many times it's going to loop so that is a sentinel loop so the number of loops is not predetermined and any loop type will work with sentinel loops now the reason I put it here in this section of the lecture is because I typically when I'm creating sentinel loops use while loops here's an example then of a sentinel loop and it's using a while loop so what the program does is it's going to prompt the user to enter a grade and it tells them how to stop the loop how to exit the program so it says enter a grade greater than 100 to end the program 
So if, if you're entering grades, normally the grades would be uh, 0 through 100. So if you enter something larger than 100, that's not really a grade. That's a signal to the program or the sentinel value that says stop. I, I'm finished entering grades. Don't, don't uh, continue looping. Stop looping. So here's the code. It says while the grade that you just entered is less than or equal to 100. In other words, while it looks like a grade. Well, it, this code does not check for negative grades. Most of the programs we write, we're assume, assuming uh, perfect users. So we're not assuming somebody that's trying to trying to trick our program. Uh, we're, we're assuming the person using the program is using it uh, correctly. And in the real world, of course, we don't get perfect users, but for simplicity's sake uh, in, in demos, it really helps. Uh, to, to make the program simple. So assu assuming a perfect user, uh, if they enter grades uh, 0 through 100, it'll keep looping. When they enter something greater than 100, this will be false. And then that's the sentinel, that's the signal that says, I'm finished entering grades, stop looping. So as long as they're valid grades, we're going to uh, take the grade that was entered and we're going to add that to the current total and save that back into total. And so we started out with something, a variable called total that we initialized to zero, and they're gonna enter a grade, and we're gonna add that to the current total and then store it back into total. And then we're going to prompt them to enter uh, another grade, and then we're going to say, uh, and then we're gonna read that grade in, and it's gonna loop back up. Oh, and, and not another grade, we haven't entered the grade yet. That, that was the first grade, so. so that that the structure of this loop is very important uh, or this is a very clever design and I didn't create this so I'm gonna say it's clever whoever the programmer was that came up with this uh, this is a very uh, very clever design this is an example of what's uh, uh, elegant programming this would be called elegant programming uh, so look at the design of this loop uh, for a moment it says okay here's how you stop the the program from looping and then it does a while and then it totals the grades. But we haven't entered a grade yet. So, so why did they do that? Why, why did they put this line that says total equals total plus grade when we have not entered a grade yet at this point in the program? Right now, grade is zero and total is zero. So this is just simply going to say uh, zero plus zero, store that back in total, which was already zero. So it does nothing the first time through. So why did they do that? Why did they put that line of code there? And then it's going to prompt for the grade. And then it's going to read the grade in from the keyboard. And then it's going to loop back up. So why is it structured the way it is? Why not enter the grade first? OK, here's why. This is, this is why this is elegant. By structuring it the way they did, the last statement in the loop is the input. That means the next statement the next part of the code that runs will be the test grade less than or equal to 100 here's why they did that if you enter a number greater than 100 that's not a grade if if the user enters uh, 999 at this point that's not a grade that's a sentinel the user says okay I'm done I don't want to enter any more grades. 999 is bigger than 100. I'm finished. We don't want to add that. We, we don't want to add that 999 to our total. And so by putting this input at the bottom of the loop, the next code that runs, if I entered 999, the very next statement that runs is this test. Is grade less than or equal to 100? Well, 999, false. No, that's not less than 100. So false, exit the loop. And so it does not add the sentinel value into the total. That's very clever. That's a very clever way to structure this loop. I, I, I'm going to say this is elegant programming. Simply by structuring it so that the input is the last line in the loop prevents the sentinel from being added to the total. Now we could have done that. We could have uh, used an if statement in there to prevent adding in the sentinel value, but that would have required extra code that this uh, example does not. So very clever, very elegant. And so after it finishes looping, after you enter the sentinel value, 
then it displays the total of the grades and then it pauses. So let's let's take a look at this. Let's run this. So this is example four. So here it is running. Enter grade greater than 100 to end the program. So I'm going to enter a grade. Okay, so let's say uh, 100 and then 90. And then I enter my Sentinel value, 999. Okay, it says the total of the grades is 190. And that's correct. It, it did not add the Sentinel value. That's what we want. That, that's because, again, that was not really a grade. Let's look at how most of us 90 plus percent of us would have written this program if we just sat down and tried writing it just without really thinking too much about it. What would that look like? Probably what we would do is we would say, same sort of thing, okay, uh, greater than 100 done the program. This would look the same. But then what we would do is we would do this. We would we prompt for and read the grade first. What do I want the program to do? Okay, I want it to prompt for the user to enter a grade and I want them to enter the grade. And then we, we might do this, and then we might loop. Okay. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna run the program. Same thing, 100, 90, 999. Okay, it stopped looping, but look at the total. I said, oh, oh, you would say, oh of course, uh, I didn't wanna do that. I, I, I did not wanna add the Sentinel value and obviously that's what's happening. Okay, I can fix that. So then we, we go back to our code and we would say, well, if, if I enter a Sentinel value, I don't want to total it. So I can go in here and I can use an if statement. And I can say if, uh, if the grade is less than or equal to 100, then I want to total it. Now we can run the program. And we'll do the same thing again. 100 and 90 and 999. And ah, it works. That's what most of us would do. It's working correctly. I got the correct answer. It's not adding in the Sentinel value. We did it by adding an if. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it is correct. It's, it, it's doing what we want the program to do. But it's just not as elegant as that uh, solution was without the if. Uh, or just by moving a few lines of code around, it accomplished the same thing. So whenever you see programs like that, you don't understand exactly why the programmer did what they were doing. Take some time to figure out what's going on and why that was done that way. It can help you improve your programs by analyzing what other programmers have done in their code. Here's a flowchart uh, for, I think this is the, yeah, this is the program we just looked at. So a while loop, uh, so we have start, we have our variables being declared uh, in our preparation symbol, then we are prompting for, uh, or actually we're uh, telling them how to stop the loop. So this is the instructions, enter a grade greater than 100 to end. Here's our while test, it's a diamond shape, just like the if. So grade less than or equal to 100. So that can either, either be true or false. And if that's true, or while that's true, uh, do the total, and then prompt for the grade, and then input a grade. And then here's the loop. So you indicate the loop with a flow line. So there was, there's our loop. And then it exits from the top, from the diamond. So when this is false, it exits the loop, and it displays the total of the grades is, and then the program ends. So there's our flow chart for our uh, example program we just saw. Break statement. Uh, the break statement we saw with the switch when we wanted to uh, uh, exit the switch, and the break statement uh, can be used inside loops, and what the break statement does inside loops is it exits the loop. Um, it exits the loop immediately if you run a break statement, and I don't like using break statements to exit loops. Um, I'm going to say that you should use them sparingly. The reason is, if you have a loop, and you can really see this if you look at a flowchart for a loop, a loop, a nice structured loop, 
should have one entry point and one exit point. And with the while loop, that's the diamond. So the, we have one entry point. Now this flowchart flowing sideways maybe hides the fact a little bit. So let's ignore this over here. For, let's say the loop came in like this. One entry point and one exit point. That's a nice structured loop. And the same thing is true. It's just that it's the, the flow chart's going sideways. So there's one entry point, which is here. And then there's one exit point, which is over here. That's a structured loop. If you had a break statement in here somewhere, if there's a break statement anywhere in here, like right in here is a break statement, now you have an exit here. So now you have two exits. Well, you could have many, many exits. You could have break statements anywhere in the code. So break statements then you have loops with multiple exits. That's no longer a structured loop. It, it can make the program harder to read when you're looking at the code and you see a loop you now have to look through the entire body of the loop to find break statements to know if there's a way to get out of the loop early. It, it just is not clean code uh, to use break statements to exit loops. So I'm not going to say never use them, I'm just going to say try to avoid using them. If you have nested loops, loops inside loops, and there's a break statement, the break only exits the loop that it's in. So if it's if there's a loop inside a loop and you have a break statement inside that inner loop, it does not exit everything. It just exits the one loop. Here's what it would look like in your code. You almost always would need to use some sort of decision, so an if or a switch or something. Uh, so we have a while loop, and inside the while loop we have an if, and then inside the if is a break. So if that statement runs, the loop exits. It exits the loop at that point. Now the loop can still exit up here at the uh, original loop expression, but now there's a second possible exit. So that's how you would use a break statement. Continue um, is okay to use. The continue statement is used in loops. What the continue statement does is it forces the loop to go back to the loop test. So it skips the remaining body of the loop. If so continue statement runs, the remaining the code below it that's in the body is skipped and the the loop goes back to the loop test. It only again affects the current loop. If there's nested loops, it's only the current loop that's affected. You don't really need to use continue uh, because you can simply restructure the code with some different logic and make it do the same thing without using the word continue. Here's an example of continue. Uh, so we have a while loop, while grade less than or equal to 100. It says enter a grade, read in the grade. If the grade is less than zero or the grade is greater than 100, continue. So what does that mean? If the user entered a grade and they entered a number that was less than zero, meaning a negative number, or they entered a number greater than 100, continue. That means an invalid grade. That means if they enter an invalid grade, if they enter a negative number or enter a number, a grade that's greater than 100, I don't want to total it. I don't want this line of code to run. So what continue does is it skips that and goes back to the loop test. Now there could be multiple lines of code down here. All of them will be skipped. When continue runs, it goes back to the loop test. You don't really need to use continue to do that. You can restructure this code and cause the same or get the same result. And here's that, that example. So same loop, while grade less than or equal to 100, enter a grade, read in a grade. Now the loop, or the if statement says, if the grade is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 100. So what does this say? This says it's a valid grade. So the, the, er, the previous example, this if said, if it's an invalid grade, go back to the loop test. Don't total it. This example says, 
If it is a valid grade, total it. So if it's a valid grade, go down here and do this. If it's an invalid grade, it skips over that totaling. Now it's at the bottom of the loop, and it automatically goes back up to the top. So it does the same thing as continue as this example, but without using the word continue. So if you're programming in a language that does not have that feature, that does not have continue, you can do the same thing. You just restructure your code so the condition is the opposite condition. Instead of looking for an invalid grade, we're looking for a valid grade. And then we're adding that to the total. So again, continue doesn't violate any loop structures or anything, so it's, you can use it. It might make your program harder to read. You don't really need it, but it's there. The null statement. Boy, this causes lots of problems in C++. Uh, the semicolon by itself is a statement that does nothing. Missing semicolons, extra semicolons, has got to be the most common error in C++ code, certainly in, in the code that I see. You can get logical problems. You can get code that compiles with no errors and no warnings, but doesn't give you the correct answers. You, It's just causes all kinds of problems, so be careful. Really try to understand what your code says and why you need to put those semicolons in there uh, in your programs. So here's an example of a semicolon uh, causing problems in a program. And it's so hard to see this sort of thing because they're everywhere. There's semicolons everywhere in this code. There's semicolons here and here and here. And we have a problem in this code caused by a semicolon. Look at the comment. Bad semicolon causes infinite loop. Do you see it? It's hard to see. It's hard to see that there's something wrong. And what's worse, this code will compile. There's no errors, there's no warnings. In fact, let's take a look. This is example five. So here's example five. There's an infinite loop. Go ahead and run this. I'm going to show you what an infinite loop looks like when you're running it. I'm just going to run the program. And there it is. There's a flashing cursor. That's what an infinite loop looks like if nothing is being displayed. So we have a loop that's running where inside the loop, nothing is being displayed visibly. So there it is. That's all you get. It looks like the program is frozen or or locked up. I could press the Enter key. I'm pressing the Enter key right now. I can type characters. Nothing happens. It's looping. It's not waiting for input. It's not displaying anything. It's just looping. So why? Here's the culprit. That one semicolon is causing that. And note, there was no errors. There was no warnings. I compiled the program. I ran it. It ran fine. That semicolon is causing the infinite loop. It was not displaying anything, so this was not running. This C out count was not running. Why? Here's why. This is what the code looks like. Forget this code down here. As far as the loop is concerned, this is the entire loop. That's it. While count is less than or equal to 10, semicolon. That's the whole loop. The semicolon is the body of the loop. It's the null statement. It does nothing. So this loop does nothing. And once it starts doing nothing, it's stuck. It's an infinite loop. Count is equal to 2. 2 is less than or equal to 10, so that's true. It enters the body of the loop. Oh, there it is. There's the body of the loop. What does it do? Nothing. And then it loops back up, and it does it again. And again, and again, and again. And it, keeps, it does nothing. It's stuck. It's stuck doing nothing. So that semicolon, just that, just by adding that one little semicolon on the end of that line causes an infinite loop. If I take the semicolon off, now the body of the loop is this. That's what we wanted. Now it will do what we wanted it to do. So now it displays 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. But watch out. No errors, no warnings. Infinite loop. Be careful with that.
the for loop. The for loop or for statement is logically identical to the while statement. And by logically identical mean they are interchangeable. You can take any while loop or while statement and replace it with a for loop or vice versa. The for loop is also a, a shorthand way to write or a more compressed way to write a loop. And because of the fact that they're interchangeable and the fact that the for loop is, is less coding, I think most C++ programmers tend to migrate toward using the for loop instead of using the while loop. So that, in other words, they, they a lot of them don't use both. They don't use while loops and for loops. They'll use for loops for everything and, and then not use the while. What I like to do is I like to use the while loop for a sentinel controlled loop like we just talked about. And for the for loop, I like to use it when I know how many times I want to loop. So if I want to write a loop that loops 10 times, I'll use a for loop. So that's the, distinct, the uh, distinction I like to make between the two loop types. So let's take a look at the syntax uh, for a for loop. It looks quite a bit different, but logically they're the same. So the syntax is you have the word for, and then there's three parts inside the parentheses. So there's not just the expression like there was in the while loop, there's actually three parts. The first part here that I'm calling prefix, this actually happens outside of the loop. It actually happens before the loop begins, before the loop test begins. This is uh, where you initialize your loop variables typically. So in the while loop we would say, we said uh, count equals zero before the word while, before the while loop. So this is where you would put your count equals zero. This is actually not in the body of the loop. It actually happens before the test. Then you have the expression and this is exactly like the while expression. While this is true it loops. Same thing as the while loop. Then it runs the code in the body of the loop. And you can, if you have braces, you can have multiple lines of code. So it runs the code in the body. And then this alteration code, that runs at the end of the loop body. So whatever this code is, think of it as being actually inside the body of the loop, but just at the end. And that's where typically you would alter your loop variable. So whatever it is, your, your count variable or something, you say count plus plus. That's what goes in the alteration part of the loop. So here's an example, uh, four, and we're assuming the variable i has been declared earlier. So i equals zero, there's the prefix. So we're initializing the variable i to zero. Then we have the expression part, i less than 10. So is that true? Yes, it is. Zero is less than 10, so this is true. So it enters the loop, so it runs the code, displays i, does, does uh, displays a new line, and then this alteration code, this code runs at the bottom of the loop body. So i++ plus plus increments i to 1, and then it loops back up and it does the expression test again. It does not repeat the prefix. So the prefix part, that only runs once. That's not actually part of the loop. It's Think of it as this code is actually before the loop. It runs once, it does not repeat. And then you have your expression just like a while, and then this code is actually at the end of the loop body. That's the, that's the syntax of a for loop. It looks different than the while loop, but, but again, it's logically the same. So here's example six, let's take a look. So here's the example. It says we have a variable, uh, integer variable named count, Here's the for loop, and here's the, the prefix, or the initializing part of the for loop. It says, start with count equal to two. So this is not in the loop. Think of this as before the loop starts looping. So count is set equal to two. Then it does the expression test, just like a while loop. Uh, is count less than or equal to 10? True, it is. So it loops, it enters the loop. It displays count, it displays a space. Then it runs this code. It adds two to count. It loops back up and does this test again. So now it's looping. And when this is false, it exits the loop. So let's run this. And there it says two, four, six, eight, ten. The loop stops. It says press any key to continue. This variable 
count can be declared the way we see it here as a separate variable in your code, just like we did with the while loop. You may also see examples where it's declared inside, oops, inside the for loop itself, like that. So now I've declared count inside the parentheses of the for loop. It does the same thing. If I run the program, it does exactly the same thing. It displays 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. There's a technical difference between those uh, two examples. If you declare the variable inside the parentheses like I'm doing here, that variable count only exists in the for loop. It does not exist after the loop ends. If I go down here and I say uh, display count, I get an error. See that red line there? It doesn't know what to do. It's The compiler is trying to figure out what to do because count does not exist. Count only exists in the for loop. That's what declaring the, loop, the variable inside the actual for statement does. It, it only exists in the for statement. I'll get an error if I try to run this because count doesn't exist. Whereas before, count was declared as a separate variable. Count continues to exist when the loop ends. So in this case, I could display count because it continues to exist as a variable. And it, you can see there's no errors, there's no red lines. I could run it and it will work. So that's the difference. You'll see example code. Uh, if you look online, you'll see lots of examples where the, the loop variables are being declared in the parentheses. And, and there's a subtle difference in that the, the difference is when the variable is declared prior to the for loop, it continues to exist after the loop finishes. When it's declared in the for loop, it only exists in the for loop. Because a for loop is a condensed form of uh, writing a while loop, I use a condensed kind of a flowchart. In the diamond, there's still a decision, so in the diamond I just put sort of pseudocode for a for loop. So I would say for count equals 2 to 20 by 2. If you programmed in the basic language before, it kind of looks like basic. But just write it out write out what the for loop is doing. Any programmer will understand what that means. And then true or false, true means I'm looping. So what does it do in the body of the loop? And there could be, of course, lots and lots of stuff going on down here, lots of other uh, symbols and statements. It loops back up, it exits the loop, and then it goes to the rest of the code. In this simple example, the program ended, but there could be lots of other things going on over here. In a bigger program, there'd be many other symbols over here where, where statements were being processed. But this is the way I flowchart for loops. I more a condensed kind of a flowchart. Nested loops. We saw nested if statements and the fact that that causes or can have uh, logical differences. And you can have nested for loops. And you can nest any loop types. This example happens to be for loops, but you can have any loop types nested. What is important to consider when you have nested for or nested loops? What's the important thing to consider? And the important thing to consider is the inner code, and what I mean by inner code is here's a loop and here's a loop, and so this code, this C out statement, is the code that's that's inside both loops. This inner code runs a multiple of times. You take the two loop uh, counts and you multiply them together. So how many times does this code run? You take the number of loops that this uh, first loop is going to loop and you multiply it by the number of loops that the second for loop is going to loop, and that will give you the number of times that this inner code will run. So if you're not thinking about it, you can get some fairly lengthy execution times or, or sections of code that will run millions of times with, with just harmlessly changing a few numbers if you're not really careful. So in this example, uh, this first loop is going to loop uh, three times, and this second one's going to loop five times, so this code in here is going to loop 15 times. If I what if I make a simple change, what sounds like a simple change in terms of a program, 
if I made this 3,000 instead of 3, and I made it 5,000 instead of 5, and, and it's a computer, it should be fast enough to, you know, what's 3,000 to a computer? What's 5,000 to a computer? Unless you stop and think, well, it's not just 3,000 and 5,000. This code in here is now going to run 3,000 times 5,000, which is 15 million. So, so now it's going to display 15 million uh, this this code will run 15 million times. That'll take a long time to display. Uh, so be careful when you're working with nested loops and keep uh, conscious of the fact that those inner loop inner code are running a multiple of times of the two loops. This is in this example. This is what this program displays. Uh, this this uh, this uh, grid of numbers. The do loop. This is the third loop type in C++. There's only three. And this one is logically different from the other two, uh, the while and the for. The do loop, and you can see it here, the test is at the bottom of the loop, and that's what's different. So it always runs through the body of the loop at least once. So there can be multiple statements here. There's, I just show a rectangle, but there could be all kinds of things going on in here in the body of the loop. It runs through all those statements once, then it reaches the test. It loops while true, so if the expression test is true, it does go back up and loop. If the expression test is false, it exits. But the fact that the loop test is at the bottom makes it different. So you have to go through the body once. That means these statements run at least once. In the while and in the for, the test happens first. So those may not loop at all. The while and the for, if that expression is false, it exits. It does not go through the body of the loop. So the minimum number of loops in a while loop or a for loop is zero. You may not loop at all. The minimum number of loops in a do loop is one. You have to go through the body to get to the test. That's what's different. Now, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you're writing a loop. You could use any one of the three. But if you need this logical difference, that's when it calls, that's when you use a do loop. So that's what this says here. Statements in the body of the loop are executed at least once. Uh, and, oh, you have to put a semicolon. Those darn semicolons. Um, you know, we saw the example of the while loop where putting a semicolon caused an infinite loop. In the do loop, the word while is reused. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, we can't change it. There's a long history as to why that is. And it certainly can be confusing. So in order for the compiler to distinguish that between a while loop and the end of a do loop, there must be a semicolon here. So the same thing that caused an infinite loop in a while loop is required in a do loop. The good thing is, if you forget the semicolon, you will get an error. So if you're writing a do loop and you forget to put that semicolon, you get an error. Uh, but I know it's confusing. We just can't change it. It's the way the language is, and it's it's a Again, it's a long, long history and story. It's not worth going into. But here's the syntax. Do uh, braces if you have a compound statement. And then the word while is reused. The expression loops while true. You do need, to, need the semicolon. And it loops back up. And it exits uh, when the expression is false. So that's what the do loop looks like. OK, something different. Uh, no more loops. There's only the three types. File, input, output. So we've seen that you can display to the screen, and we've seen you can get input from the keyboard. You can do the same thing, uh, output and input, but to a file. And we're talking about a file on, on a storage device, on a flash drive or a disk. The output to a file and the input from, from a file is very similar to output to a screen and input from the keyboard. Just like a few steps you have to do in order to get there. But let's take a look at it. So first we're going to look at writing to a file. How do you write to a file? I want, I want to, in a program, I want to write a C++ program that creates a file and then writes data into the file. How do you do that? So here's the steps to take. You create an OF stream object. Now you need to include an, an additional header file. We'll take a look at it when we look at the code. But one of the items is uh, in the file is OF stream. So you make an OF stream variable. It says OF stream object, which is what it is, but think variable. I'll show you the code in just a moment. Then you associate the file 
that, that is the actual file on your storage device, you associate that with the object you just created. Then you open the file, you check for errors, and there might be errors because, for example, maybe the flash drive has been removed. Obviously, you can't open a file if the flash drive has been, have been removed, so you check for errors. If there are no errors, you write to the file and you close the file. So those are the steps you can take to, to create a file, write data to it, and then it'll be there. It'll be actually like a like you opened up Notepad or something and, and wrote something into a file and then saved it. So create the object, associate the file with the object, open the file, check for errors, write to the file, and then close the file. Here's an example. So this is example seven. Let's go into Visual Studio. Here's the example. So to do file input output, you include the F stream header file, file stream header file. That's what you need to include. I created a string variable. I called it file name. And that's the name of the actual file on the storage device that I want to create. That could be user input. Now in this example, I'm just associating it with a literal string, but I used a variable because I wanted to uh, give you an example where if you wanted to, instead of using literal data, you could ask the user, what's the name of the file that you want to create? Once you have that file name, you create your OF stream object, output file stream. So I'm, I'm writing to the file, output to the file. So output file stream, give it a name. This is a variable you create. This is your file object. So I call mine out file. So whatever you want to call it. And then the name of the file. What's the name of the file you want to create? So again, that's my variable. User input or literal input, create that file. Check for errors. So the way you check for errors is you use your file object name and then you can say dot fail. That's a function call. If this returns true, it means there was an error. So if you attempted to open a file or create the file and open it and fail returns true, there was an error. This syntax where it says OF stream out file and then we give it the name of the file, that attempts to create the file and open it in one step. And so it's the process of opening the file that can return the error, or that can cause an error. And this is how you can check for that error. So if that's true, there was an error, then we just display an error message, and it pauses so you can see the message, and then exit one, I don't know if we've seen that before, that actually will exit the program. It's You could do the same thing with return zero. This just is another way to, to exit a program. It's actually if an error condition occurs, it's a way to exit a program. So you might see that. I wanted to show you what that looks like, what that does. So exit, uh, re exit your program immediately. So the rest of the code doesn't even run. So if there's a, if there's a file error, it displays a message. You press a key, and then program exits. Okay. If there is no error, if the file opens correctly, now we have a file object, whatever you called it, that is the file. It's open. The file's open and we have a file object and now we can write to the file. It's very, very straightforward in C++ to write to a file. It's just like doing C out, but instead of the word C out, just put your file object. Everything works the same. All the format uh, specifiers work the same. So here's an example. Out file, fixed, set precision two. It's just like we're doing C out. Out file, set W10. The word batteries, set W7, a number. So instead of C out, it's just out file. Instead of writing to the screen, we're writing to the file. And it's formatted the same way in the file that it would be formatted on the screen. So we're creating a text file with all the formatting and everything that's exactly the same way it would be on the screen, but it's in a file. So we're going to write this data to a file, and then you close the file. Very important. After you've finished writing to the file, Close the file, so outfile.close, and that's a function. And that finalizes the, the writing to the file. The, the, as data is being written to the file, 
the data is buffered. It's, it's not all written right away. It's stored in some internal buffers in the computer. So when you close the file, that finalizes. All the data that may be buffered is written to the file. And now the file is out there just like you wrote it in, uh, created it in Notepad. And so let's take a look at this. Let's run this program. And then we'll look at the file that was created. Okay, so it doesn't really display much. It just says press any key to continue because all the output was to the file. So let's take, let's close this. Now let's go look at the file that we created. So the, the file, I did not specify where, I just said, here's the name of the file. You, you could put a full uh, path name in there if you wanted to, uh, C colon backslash, something, something, something. And, and then it would store the file wherever you told it. But if you just put the name of the file in double quotes and you're running it from inside your Visual Studio project the way I'm doing here, it's going to create the file in your project folder. So this is, uh, this is example seven. Let's go look at that file that we just created. So here's my project folder, and here's the file, sales.txt. It's just a text file. That's the name of the file I used, sales.txt, and that's the file that was created, sales.txt. And if I open it up, that's what it looks like. It, it's just a text file. It looks exactly like it would look if I created it in, no, in Notepad. So here's the code. I'll put the code over here, and I'll put the file next to it so you can see what it did. So it said... Out file, set W10, the word batteries. There's the word batteries. Set W7, display 3995. There's 3995, and you can see the set W effect. And then set W10, bulbs. There's bulbs. You can see the set W effect on that. And, and again, 322, fuses, $1.23. You can see the formatting, the way it was written to the file, just like it would work if you're doing C out to the screen. But it's in a file. reading from a file. So now we've written to a file. Let's read from it. Same sort of steps, except instead of output file stream, we want input file stream. So IF stream object, that means you're going to read from a file. You just, just like before, associate the file object with the file, open the file, check for errors, read from the file, and then close the file. So here's the code that reads from a file. Let's load that up in Visual Studio. I have a double called price. I have a string called item and a string called file name. And file name is where I put the name of the file I want to open. That could be user input again. I create my IF stream object, and this time I call it in file. Call that whatever you want. Give it the file name. That attempts to open that file, attempts to open this file in the project folders where that file is expected to be. Check for errors. If in file failed, if it did, display an error message and exit. Now we have a file that is open and ready for input. It's just like doing CN, but instead of the word CN, you put your file object. It's very straightforward in C++ to do file input output. Once you've associated the file with a file object and opened it, it's just like doing C out and C in. So instead of C in, it's file object. What am I going to read? The first item in the file. I'm going to read from the file and store into the string item. Whatever that first string is, that first word, it's going to read it into item. Remember, in reading into a string, if this were C in, you could type one word and then that would be stored in the string. If you type a word and a space in another word, only the first word is stored in the string. So the same thing happens here. If there's multiple words in the file, I'm only going to read the first word into item. If I wanted to read an entire sentence, including spaces, I would need to use getLine. 
about doing it like this, I'm only going to read one word. But that's, in this example, that's all I want. I just want to read one word. So one word, that goes into item. Now I start looping. I'm going to go through and read the rest of the data. So while in file price. Let me pull up the file so we can see what it looks like. This is the data in the file. So the first in file item is going to read the word batteries. Now we go into a while loop. While in file price and price is a double. So the next data in the file is some spaces and then the number 3995. So in file price will read 3995 into price because the leading spaces will be ignored. Just like if you did a CN and you typed spaces and then a number, those leading spaces are ignored when you're reading a double. So it reads the number 3995. It does C out item, which is the string batteries, displays the space, displays price, which is a double, 39.95, displays a new line, and then it says in file item. That's a string again. So we just finished reading the first line. Now it's going to look for a string. It's going to read bulbs. So bulbs gets read into item. It loops back up. It says while in file price. That goes to the next item in the file, which is 322. That gets read into price. It displays those two. It reads the next item, which is fuses. Loops back up. Reads the price. $1.23. Displays fuses and the price. And now it tries to read something else, the next item, and there is nothing else. That'll get to the end of the file and then when it tries to read price, it'll say, I'm at the end of the file. That will cause, or that will return false. When you try to do this, when you try to read from a file and you're at the end of the file, this operation, reading from the file, returns false. So when it returns, because it's, it's at the end of the file. So when it's at the end of the file and you try to read, that returns false. That causes the while statement to stop looping. And then it closes the file and then the program ends. So let's take a look. Let's run this. I've copied that file that we created earlier into this project folder. So the, the, it, it, it's important to do that. The first program we ran created it in its project folder. Now this is a separate project folder. I've already copied that text file into this project folder. So let's go ahead and run this. And there it is. So it ran, it read the data from that file we just saw, and it displays the contents on the screen. Okay, so we had a lot, a lot of ground to cover in this, uh, in this lecture. We looked at three loop types. Uh, we looked at the uh, while loop or while statement, and that's a pretest loop. The test is at the top. We looked at the for loop, uh, which is logically identical to the while. The distinction I made was the while loop is the loop I use for a sentinel controlled loop where I'm using external input to control the loop. And the for loop is the type I use when I, I want to loop a certain number of times. Then we looked at the do statement or do loop. Uh, that's a post test loop, which means the test is at the bottom. So you have to go through the code at least once. We talked about sentinel loops and any of the three loop types can be a sentinel loop. That's a loop that's controlled by an external input. We talked about break and continue statements and their use in loops. Use break sparingly. Uh, you'll see examples, I'm sure, where it's used. And I may have used it once or twice in my life, but not very often. Um, continue statements are okay, but you don't really need to use them. Just restructure the, the logic, and you can avoid using those also. By far, the most common problem that I see in C++ code is caused by the semicolon, and I, you know, it's just a fact of life. I guess we can't get rid of it, but watch out for those. Be very, very careful when you're writing your, your loops. Uh, we talked about nested loops and how the internal code has a multiplicative effect. That is, it runs the number of loops times the number of loops, so be consciously aware of that. And then lastly, we just got an introduction to file input output. 
just how to uh, create a text file, how to read from a text file. We'll look more in depth at that uh, file input output uh, in later courses, but this is just enough to get us started if we wanted to uh, have to do some simple file input output. So that concludes uh, this lecture.